what we think is perfect and how God is perfect is so different. When we were singing that song, I was reminded of, um, I think it's Psalm 78. Psalm 78 has 72 verses in it. And it's all about God's mercy and his goodness to Israel. You know, God did this, then they rebelled. God did that, then they rebelled. God did this, he took them out of that, and they rebelled. And, and it goes on, and like, like I, don't, I know when I read that song, I'm like, you know, just, you know, enough already. How many times does the Lord have to prove himself? We can expect great things from our God. Awesome things. And in looking at the year ahead, ask God to raise your expectancy. You know, some of us have lived a long time and we've gone through a lot of things. And we can look back and say, God was faithful. He carried me, He took me, He provided for me. He, 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 I've been talking a lot about my testimony lately because I'm amazed looking back. He really did fulfill your word. He really did keep your promise. You really have provided. You really have healed me. May you come and keep your eyes focused on the Lord. Keep your eyes on His goodness. He's a good, good, perfect Father. And the word says that his goodness chases after us. You know, it comes running after us. He desires to be good to us. That's awesome. I mean, I think I'm a pretty good parent, but I'm not always so so anxious to shower goodness on my kids. You know, I love them, but I'm limited. Amen. Expect goodness of God to overtake you mm-hmm. in the coming year. Oh, yeah. Keep our eyes on him. Yes. Not on the circumstances, not on the things around us, most of which we can't do anything about. But his goodness is chasing after us. Amen. And his keeping power is with us. Amen. He's a good, good God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I want to thank you guys. Um, my husband and I, Pastor and I, um, received an awesome Christmas gift from all of you. Um, above and beyond uh, our expectations of what we thought. So thank you so, so, so much. It was very timely, and um, we were just blessed by your generosity. So thank you. Amen. Amen. Bless you. How many times are you going to hear it? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Year. Enough already. How many want to do 2022 over? Yeah, I didn't think so. Me either. But we are looking forward. We are looking forward to a new year. Not only another year, but a new year. A year um, that's full of promise, a year that holds awesome potential, a year of um, anticipation, a year of expectancy. I mean, it's one thing to be glad last year is done. You put that up in your bed. But it's another to look at the coming year and say, Oh, oh, I hope we don't have another one like that. Oh, I hope we're past this. Oh, oh, I hope, oh, oh, I just wish, I I just wish this year is going to be different. Every year is different. Every year is different, especially for the child of God. And every year holds more promise. And if there's no other promise that you can hold on to, if you can't find in this word, a 
promise that's yours, that specifically gets your attention and holds holds on to you, then um, at least, at least the excitement of a new year and being closer to the fulfillment of something that has not yet happened. Okay, if for no other reason we're this much closer than we were last year to something that God has promised, that's something that God has in store for us, that um, uh, something that maybe you've been waiting for for a long time. But hold on. I, I, I remember Pastor Nick Bella, who's been home with the Lord many years now, who used to say, when you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on because there's something to hold on to and a reason to hold on for. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. I thought um, being in the um, in that tween place between the end of one year and the beginning of, of another, I thought I would look to um, both the Old and the New Testament. And so I, I'd like to share with you out of the Book of Lamentations, which is the one that follows Jeremiah and was most likely written by Jeremiah. And it was written at a time when the children of Israel, or the nation of Israel, was under judgment for their disobedience. And it just caused me to wonder how much is God going to put up with with this nation? How much have we tried to and I say we as, as, as a whole not us individually but a people and a nation or I don't want to play follow the leader anymore unless my leader is Jesus. I really don't. I don't think anybody knows better for me than I do based on what's recorded in this word. That's, this is what we have. This is what we hold on to. This is what guides us. This is what protects us. This is what provides for us. This is what propels us into the, the will of God. But the nation of Israel was under judgment for their continual and repeating disobedience. And that, that should shake some of us up. While we may not be individually guilty, if we're not part of the solution, we are part of the problem. And Israel was being punished. Yet, yet the prophet Jeremiah and he had endured much. And every time he tried to present God for the people, it was, oh yeah, we listen to you, look at the mess we're in. Well, they didn't listen to him. And they were in a mess. And the mess was of their own, own doing. But Jeremiah found hope. And in chapter 3 of Lamentations, I, I want to begin this new year with hope and with um, a solid foundation for hope, a reason to hope and to believe that the Word of God and the God of the Word are trustworthy, that we can rely on them, that we can put our confidence in them. Again. Um, I know at the, at, at the risk of being repetitive, and oh, we heard that already. I, I share with you my definition of faith. Faith is having your feet firmly planted in midair. That's faith. It's, it's believing what you've been told but can't see, or it hasn't happened yet. But God never fails. His word is never early, and it's never late. It's always right on time, and it's always complete. 
as to how he, he had given it to us. But in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22, here's, here's the cry of the prophet. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease. You can't run out of his mercy. You just can't. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning, and great is his faithfulness. Even when you don't feel like it, even when it doesn't look like it, even when it doesn't seem like it'll ever come to pass, God is faithful. And he's compassionate towards his people. Why would God be compassionate towards the child of God? Why is he compassionate to the unbeliever? Because he's a, a covenant-keeping God. His compassions flow out of his covenant. God keeps his word. We're, we're not as reliable when it comes to that. Oh, we, we may be better at it than we're worse at it but we can't compare to him. A covenant-keeping God whose compassions fail not, whose mercies are new every morning. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. The scriptures don't tell us that bad things happen to good people. We, we see accounts of it, but that's not a scripture we stand on. God is faithful, and he takes care of his own. He does tell us that he will test us. There are challenges. Listen, it's called life. You know, it's not, um, it's not a downhill slide. It's not tiptoeing through the tulips. You know, it's not skipping merrily along. But it's a challenge. But the thing is, the child of God never faces that challenge alone. And he's equipped with those mercies that are new every morning. With a, with a, um, a refreshing hope and a continued confidence. Yeah, it's getting bad out there, but God's still sovereign and he's still in charge. The, the Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. Lord, grant me patience, but hurry. <laughs> Isaiah tells us, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You don't get weary in waiting. You get stronger in waiting. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run and not be weary. Walk and not faint. It's kind of the reverse. We usually walk, then we run, then we, you know, jump up and take off. He says, if we wait upon him, if we wait upon him, we'll renew our strength. Soar like an eagle. Run. Not be weary. Walk and not faint. What's walk? It's getting up every day and believing. Amen. That's walking. That's saying, yes, God, you're still God. I may not have the, what is it? We may not have it all together, but together we have it all. I mean, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And that's why we come together, because we need each other. I need your portion, hopefully you need mine. Um, we've got something of value to share with one another. The Lord is <laughs> good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. It is good that he waits silently in hope for the salvation of the Lord. Um, to them, 
Salvation was yet future. Salvation was something to be hoped for, something that was promised but had not yet been revealed. If we look to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, the Hall of Faith, we find out that all those from Abraham on who held on to the promise, even though they didn't see it, were rewarded because they had to they had to pass through the gates of eternity, but they were rewarded. And they held on to it. And they believed it even though they didn't see it. What are you and I believing that we haven't seen yet? But he is unfolding ever so slowly. And we want God to just, could you speed it up? I'm getting weary here. And yet the word says not to be weary in well-doing. Waiting is tough. Waiting is really tough. It's tougher than the dentist's waiting room. That's the worst place I can think of to wait. I don't even mind waiting outside a courtroom. But the dentist, I don't want to wait. I want to get out. You know? And then it's never as bad as you imagined, is it? Until you have to pay. <laughs> But God promises us, he gives us hope. He gives us a reason to trust him. He tells us, you know, that he, is, and he demonstrates his faithfulness. And if God was faithful yesterday, he'll be faithful today. And if he's faithful today, he'll be faithful tomorrow and the next day. What, what more could we ask of a heavenly father? who watches over us, who watches over his word to perform it, and who um, really offers us some uh, comfort in, in, in a time of confusion. Do, do you look at some of the, the confusion that surrounds us? Some of the things that people are coming up with. It took us so long to learn English, and now they want to change the meaning of all the words. I don't want to go back to school to learn that. I want to stick with what I know. I, I, I think I got a good foundation, and I want to hold on to that, you know? God is good. So that's, that's something from the Old Testament, the promise of his compassion, his covenant, his commitment to that covenant. You and I, we're, we're you know, in for penny, in for pound kind of thing. But the truth be told, we'd all admit, Ooh, I've missed it on occasion. But God has it. His commitment, there's no lack. He's faithful. Mercy's new every morning. Let's look at the gospel more on, on a brighter note. I don't think you can get any brighter um, than, than God's faithfulness. Mark, and we're, we're beginning chapter 4. This, this should encourage any of you who have been involved in education at all. Whether you've, whether you've been in the nursery or Sunday school teacher, or, or, or a teacher, or you've had a chance to teach, um, uh, whether professionally or as a volunteer. Uh, chapter 4 begins, he began to teach again by the sea. Jesus was, among so many other things, a teacher. When he spoke, people listened. He had something to impart. And he always, he always, had something of value and promise to his audience. And such a very large crowd gathered to him, like here. <laughs> and he got into a boat in the sea and sat down. And the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things the way he taught. Jesus was a storyteller. He taught in parables. And he was saying to them in his teaching, listen to this. 
why would you go to school and not listen to a teacher? I'm just putting my time in. I need this, I need this class so I can take driver's ed, you know, or, or some such ridiculous motive. I remember as a freshman in college, and I won't tell you the college, but <clears throat> I remember the teacher opening opening day with this statement. He said, forget high school. I want you to know there's no such thing as certainty. That was my introduction to college. I mean, I was scared enough. There's no such thing as certainty. And the kid raised his hand. He said, so are you sure? He said, I'm positive. He said, I'm out of here. <laughs> that made no sense. What he was saying was the only thing you can be sure of is that you can't be sure of anything. And that was not true. That was not true. But that's, that was the thinking of that day. And we did have paper and pens. We, it wasn't stones and chisels. <laughs> but can you imagine that some, some of the things that are presented as fact, you know, I think one of my pastors was so right when he said you need to chew the meat and spit out the bones. Because not everything that comes your way, not, a, not everything that glitters is in gold. Not everything we've been told is in truth. And child of God, don't take anybody's word for it. And, and I put myself at the head of the list. Don't take my word for it. If you hear something and you like it, check it out. Make sure that's what this book says. And if you're not sure, take it to prayer. Ask the Holy Spirit. Because he's a God of order, not a God of confusion. He will give you a right answer. Sometimes, listen, sometimes men get excited. Women get excited. Or we, we see something. Or we make a doctrine. But that's not what the, what the scriptures are saying. Listen to the teacher. And, and Jesus, Jesus never gave them the wrong direction. He said, listen to this. Behold, the sower went out to sow. As he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on the rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced 30, 60, and 100 fold. How, how, many, how many types of soil? One seed, but how many types of soil did you get? I, I got four. Four. Four very different types of soil and four very distinct and different responses to sowing seed on that soil. And he was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. I, I, you ever wonder about that? Why would Jesus say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear? If you remember from your literature classes, friends, Romans, and countrymen, lend me your ears. Well, if they lent their ears, then they couldn't hear this. What were they saying? Pay attention. Pay attention. There's more to this than is on the surface. There's a, a deeper, uh, more important significance. As soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parable. And he was saying to them, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. But those who are outside get everything in parables. You know, stories are a great way to illustrate a point. Stories 
bring home um, the conclusion that either the author or, or the lecturer is trying uh, to bring across. And stories are a great way they hold your attention. Because when somebody starts, and not, I don't mean once upon a time, but when somebody starts with a story, you, you listen a little more carefully because you don't want to miss some of it because you don't know what's going to come back and what they're going to land on. And there, some folks love to listen to stories, some love to tell stories, some enjoy both. Um, but Jesus taught with stories, with parables, and he always made his point. And he never left them wanting, saying, gee, that was awesome. I wonder what he meant. No, people got the point. People understood. People realized, oh, that was heavy. You know, let's let's go back and look at that again. All right. And he said to them, to you it has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside get everything in parables. So that while seeing, they may see and not perceive. And while hearing, they may hear and not understand. Otherwise, they might return and be forgiven. Jesus said, I'm explaining something. It's a kingdom principle. I want you to know it. I want you to understand it. And I want you to embrace it. But that was an awful lot to lay on folks who had a basic understanding of life and struggle to make life work. You know, they didn't have frozen food. They had to shop every day. They had to bring a harvest in and set up their booths, and people had to buy, and folks had, usually, folks had just enough to get today's portion. And then they went back to work tomorrow, and at the end of the day, they came back to the market and got that portion. Life was hand to mouth, you know, and, and that's, that's what they meant. You worked, you got paid, you went, you bought the provisions for that day. You built your own home out of whatever you could find. It was, it, it, it's, you know, just that was the life cycle. We have so many conveniences today, and we don't appreciate, we don't appreciate uh, what's happened in, in 122 years. You know, 1900, the fastest way uh, to get around was on a horse. Same as Adam in the garden. Nobody could move any faster. And then, you know, uh, we developed an automobile. The Wright brother got, got a, 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 a vehicle to fly. Now we put men on the moon. Um, we can do interspace travel. We can go, you know, it, it would take a journey of maybe five to six months to go from New York to California, now you're doing a couple hours, if the pilot shows up. <laughs> yeah. So um, it, it's amazing what we take for granted, but none of this should be taken for granted, because all of it is so vital and so important to the child of God today. So he said in verse 14, the sower sows the word. These are the ones who are beside the road where the word is sown. And when they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. Hmm. Now let's look at that first, first group. They're, they're on the side of the road. The road is, is hard. The seed can't take root, um, and, and quickly the enemy comes in and distracts you, so you forget it. The seed has no place to, to take root, and it either blows away or the birds eat it. How, how often we've been told something of value, and, and, and it, it got dismissed because of a distraction or something else. Somebody sneezes online in King Cullen. What do you say? God bless you. And, and, you know, it's just a natural reaction. It's a blessing. 
That person says, oh, thank you. Do you think they're going to remember that somebody said, God bless you? And that God would therefore bless them? That that wasn't uh, just um, uh, an exhortation. It was a prayer. And do, do you know why we say that when somebody sneezes? Because it was once believed that when you sneezed, your heart stopped or skipped a beat. So you said, God bless you, so that the person continued to live. It was legitimate. It was valid. It had, it had support. And, uh, you know, we, we just pass it off. We have to teach people to say thank you after you say, God bless you. But they walk away. You forgot you said it, and they forgot they heard it. For the most part. You know, we're polite. But what does God bless you mean? To the child of God, it means something. Yeah, let me take a minute. I'll come back to that. Let me, let me go to Numbers chapter 6. Do you, do you know what a real blessing is? What a real benediction is? Here's, here's how God set it up himself. In Numbers chapter 6 and verse 22. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. There's a blessing you might want to stand still for. There's a blessing that's from the mouth of God through his servant Moses to his brother Aaron to the people. That, that's powerful. But so is God bless you. That's where it comes from. Connecting people, reminding them there is a God. He's a holy God. He's a sovereign God. He's in charge. And he blesses. So um, it was just an illustration about how quickly we can forget the value, the purpose, the meaning of something. Then he continues, in a similar way, these are the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. And then, when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. How fragile is your faith? I'm a believer. I'm every, as long as things are going good, it's me and God. We're a team. We really got it together. We're in lockstep. But as soon as it doesn't happen your way, or the way you understood it, or the way you want to believe it, what happens to your faith? Does it crumble? Do doubts, are doubts sown in place of the faith that the Word of God says you're entitled to? The thing you're supposed to believe? It fell on rocky soil. No place for it to really take root. And I don't just mean people who've been walking with the Lord a long time. You can have good, rooted faith as a novice, as a new believer, because you're putting your faith and your trust in God. Yes, my sins are forgiven. Yes, I'm, I'm a new creation. Yes, I'm changing the way I think and the way I live. Yes, something's different. That, that faith is, is, is rooted. But not for this person. Oh, I was so happy to hear that. That sounds so good. So many false um, precepts and principles are thrown at us. We can't sort through them. We don't know, you know. How about, how about this? God helps those who help themselves. Yay, I like that. You know, you know where that's found? Second opinions. Okay, that's found in Poor Richard's Almanac. 
Ben Franklin. You know, that's a nice proverb. A stitch in time saves nine. Try, try taking that before the Lord. You know, I mean, these things have merit in a worldly existence. But we live in a different kingdom. We live in a different realm. We, we are spiritual beings. We are now complete because of our faith in Christ. But all this other stuff, you know, how oh, it was for the moment. Listen, can you remember seeing your first Christmas tree? The lights and, and um, you know, and the decorations, and all the excitement of Christmas. And then after 50, 60 of those, oh, we got to get a tree again? You know, it kind of loses its glitter and its glamour. Don't bring that thing in a house. All the needles will fall off. You know, what a, what a change of, of assessment and attitude after doing something for so long. You know, why, why did we do this? The kids are all grown. They have their own homes. Let's go there. Mess up their house. You know, you know but, but not so with the word of God. And not so with the promises of God. And not so with the presence of God. He's always welcome. And he's always accessible. And he's always available. All right. And others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word. They had ears. They heard. They understood. But when God wasn't a genie in the bottle that they could rub, and he didn't pop out and solve their problem immediately, they weren't all that thrilled. But the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. You may have heard it. You may have understood it. You may have held on to it, but you dismissed it, or you let other things overthrow it or replace it. How sad to have come that close to the value of the word of Almighty God and then put it down because of an investment or put it down because of an opportunity or change careers when God had you in a place where he was using you and wanted, um, and, and wanted you to be light and salt. Or, well, we need a bigger home. We want a bigger home. We need a fourth car, just in case the first three have a problem. Now, whatever it is that attracts you. Now, does that mean God doesn't want us to have nice things? Absolutely not. And does it mean that if he provides the means that we can't enjoy those things? Of course not. But if those things keep you from gathering with the body, if those things um, uh, take precedent and, and well, I, you know, um, I just... I just have to, you know, I just got to, I got to make sure there's no barnacles on this puppy, you know? So every summer Sunday, I'll scrape. You know, is, is it really worth it? Is the couple of seasons of enjoyment that keep you from the Lord, that keep you from daily um, checking into his word or coming together? For, you, you can have a lovely summer home. And you can go there, and you can pray, and you can relax, and you can read the Word, and you can have folks over and have a picnic. You can do all those things. Don't displace your relationship with Him. Keep it balanced. It's just, it's, it's so valuable, and it will last for all eternity. Will the vote? You know, ask yourself. Yes, it's okay to have things. Don't let the things have you. All right. And he says, and others on the ones are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. 
These are the ones who have, have heard the word, but the worries of the world, and I just read it, I'm sorry, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires of other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Other things enter in and choke the word. It's not the one thing. It's the one thing plus the next thing plus the next thing, and gradually you don't have time for the things of God. I don't have time to study. Um, it's, but don't you understand? It's a 75 inch TV. And, and man, the game, um, it, it's like being there. No, it's better than being there. If you went there, you'd be, you know, 82 rows up and, and looking at it on your phone because you got a better shot. You know, um, sometimes we really shoot ourselves in the foot. But the last type, and those who are the ones on whom seed was sown on the good soil, and they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, 30, 60, and 100 fold. Wow. Wow. This, this kind of leaves us with two questions. What, what kind of soil are you regarding the word, the person, the presence, the relationship with the Holy God? What, what kind of soil are you? Are, are, are you interested in the word of God? Or I just fulfill my obligation on Sunday? Uh, has the word of God spoken to you? Has God um, revealed himself to you through his word? Has he, has he touched you in a way? You know, he'll touch these physical bodies, but that's temporary. Everybody Jesus healed ultimately died. And everybody that he rose from the dead died again. Otherwise, we have some 2,000-year-old people walking around. And we would know it. It's just not recorded. You know, what's really valuable, saints? What really matters? What, what, what has, um, what has so much interest that it has um, replaced or supplanted your relationship with the Holy God? This first day of the new year, we're about to share the communion table. The communion table is not um, is not miraculous. We don't change that into anything, nor do we expect it to be changed into anything. We simply consider it as representing the greatest sacrifice known to man or through mankind. The fact that we acknowledge what the communion table represents, says we have an understanding or at least an acquaintance with a holy God, that we have come into his presence, that we have been received by him, <laughs> forgiven by him, washed clean by him, refreshed by him, filled with a holy spirit by him, and we're walking in that newness of life. Just as we were finishing dinner last night, uh, a thump at, at the kitchen wall, and it was either FedEx or UPS, but um, an envelope hit the wall, opened the kitchen door, waved to the guy, and opened the envelope to find this book. America will be saved. The author, Kelly Brake. Some of you have heard Kelly Brake speak in this church. Um, he, he was a pastor here on Long Island um, in Hicksville, Holy Spirit Christian Church. Um, we, we used to pray together, and um, God sent him back to the mission field. He turned his church over uh, to a, a young man, and he went to Alaska to the large uh, Assembly of God Church there. Didn't want to go to Alaska, but that's where God sent him. And so for seven years, they were in Alaska, and then they traveled to the mission field. Well, back in, I think it was 2013, God put it on his and his wife's heart to travel to all 
50 states in the United States and prayed for revival. It took them five years, but they visited every state. Had a, a nice little thing in here about New York. But um, I, I want to read to you as we prepare for communion. I'm going to give you scripture. I'm going to give you a real life testimony. Um, he spoke about his parents separating for the third time and his mother taking responsibility for the kids. And off they went. And um, they were in New York. And he, he says, it was shortly thereafter that I made my awful announcement about resigning as a Christian, as a teenager. But shortly still after that, when God's redemptive purposes prevailed, and he hunted me down at Nyack College to herd me back into the fold. It had occurred on the second or third day on campus where I had arrived firmly determined to be expelled because he was bad and he was always getting into trouble and that's why he wanted to resign as a Christian. He said, I can't do it. I can't do this. I can't, I can't follow God um, and, and I'm always getting in trouble. He said, where I had arrived firmly determined to be expelled. In chapel that first week, our campus chaplain was presiding over the observance of communion. The elements made their way back and forth down the rows of chairs, slowly approaching my room. I was stricken with sorrow at how I was no longer worthy to partake of this fellowship by honoring his sacrifice in the ordinance of Holy Communion. I was wretchedly backslid, but still retained a fear of God. Touched those elements, and I knew I might very well die. Just ask me to forgive you. I heard the whisper distinctly, and I knew from where it had come. The Spirit of God within had not deserted me, as I had presumed. He had been waiting for the right moment to remind me of God's unfailing love. I answered silently and in total sincerity. I can't. I've done too much. And I've done it too many times. Over and over again, I heard again the same whisper as the communion plates came nearer to my room. Just ask me to forgive you. In desperation that it just might work, I whispered back to the voice from within. Lord, please forgive me. The words I heard next marked me for the remainder of my life. I forgive you. Now take and eat. In a moment, all my shame and unworthiness washed away. God was not only forgiving me, but he was completely restoring me. He was granting me immediate and complete access to full fellowship with him. He wasn't repelled by my situation. He was drawn toward me so that he could change it. And there was no time out for bad behavior. God is ready, willing, and able to restore each and every one of us. God is ready, willing, and able to forgive and forget and to give us a new option on life. Um, I had asked earlier, um, what kind of soil have you become? And are, are you content to be at that place? You know, have the things of the world choked out your desire for a relationship with the Lord? Have you just does the word just not speak to you anymore? Does it not make sense? Have you, you know, has it fallen by the side of the road? Is it shallow rooted? Um, have the, the things of the world choked it out? Or are you, are you good soil that God can sow into and sow more seed and call you to a higher level? relationship with him. Roger, if you would um, just have the uh, ushers come and, and, and distribute the elements. 
I, I, I wanted to share, I don't know why I got this yesterday. I don't have, well, I did speak to Kelly this week. He called me from Florida. But um, he said, do you have my book? I said, no. He said, well, you will. And sure enough, you know, last night it, it, it arrived. But um, here's a man I know. I've known for years. Whenever he's on Long Island, he always searches us out. Thank you, David. And he, um, and we have sweet fellowship and find out where they are ministering. They go, I, I can't say where, but they go into Muslim countries under the radar and they have planted churches. And you need to know Muslim people are coming to faith in Christ in, in ways we would never have imagined or understood, just like Korea. When, when Dr. Cho went up on Prayer Mountain and all the Korean people started coming to faith in, in, in Christ and leaving the idols, so it is the Muslim people are being drawn to Christ. To God be the glory. But I, I wanted to read that because I don't know anybody that was in that bad of shape and I didn't know that my brother was. Um, he never, never shared that. But if, if God can speak to somebody who's ready to hang it up because they haven't, haven't been able to do it in their own strength, or you, you know, some of us, and I, I, I say this haltingly, some of us look to the Lord like we look to the lottery. I'll shoot out a prayer, and maybe I'll be the winner today like God is only going to answer three? Don't we realize he has our best interest at heart? He knows. He knows what things we have need of before we ask, but he encourages us to ask. Some of you have been praying the same prayer, not for years, but for decades, and you're not getting an answer because you're not listening. You want, you want God to be reasonable and do it your way, and that ain't happening. But if you have ears, put your ears on this morning and listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and let God tell you, don't let go, don't give up, don't quit, but stop telling God how to do it, okay? He's been at it longer than you and I, and he knows the best way to, to handle these things. So I encourage you, I encourage you, before we take of, partake of these elements, which are only to remind us of the price that was paid to purchase yours and my salvation. Man, nobody, nobody loves you more. Nobody's loved you longer. Nobody cares more about you or has treated you better than the Lord God Almighty. And think, can you, Lord, can you kick me up a notch? Can I move to better ground? Can I be better soil? Can I find my place in the body of Christ? Can I be one you can trust with seed to sow that I too might bring forth um, uh, a spoil for you? Some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Lord God, you didn't save us to be statistics. You saved us that you might use us you called us that we might uh, be the reflection of Christ, that the image of God's own Son would be revealed in each and every one of us. So I just ask you, take a moment. Make your peace with him. Ask and receive what he has for you. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus, with his disciples, took bread and he broke it. And he said to them, take this and eat it, for this is my body, which is broken for you.
same way he took the cup. He said to them, this cup is a new covenant in my blood which will be shed for the remission of sin and the salvation of many. You may partake. that you find that the message would provoke you to consider what kind of soil you are and what kind of soil do you want to be. And that this new year will get off to a great start because you have the opportunity to serve God in a new and exciting way. Amen? Amen. Amen.